Hey there, guys. This is your vice president for Internet Infidels, Edward Tamesian. As you all know, I have that good scholarly paper on the origin of evil and theistic art determinism that people like John W. Loftus and others have been promoting. And uh, I have invented their very first official YouTube channel, Freethinker Podcast, where I've interviewed great individuals. And today I'm going to be interviewing some other great individuals that I've already done interviews with, namely the ex-Cuban spy and physicist Bill Gady. Thanks for being on. And uh, Jason Thibodeau, who is one of our board of directors and has an excellent piece on the Rifrio Dilemma available in Internet Infidels Modern Library section. And uh, today Bill's going to help us talk about some physics and some problems with the mathematical establishment. So I'll just let you take it away, Bill, and you can tell us whatever you'd like to say. Well, okay, the issue, I guess, uh, that um, we were gonna talk about today are dimensions, dimensions, coordinates, and vectors, I guess. I'll put all three of them in there. And yep. I, what I wanna say there to start out, to kick uh, start the uh, meeting here, is that um, mathematics has a different, or we can call it mathematical physics, has a different, notion of what a dimension coordinate and vector uh, are compared to what genuine physics okay so we have mathematical physics against genuine physics genuine physics says a dimension is length width and height that's what it is what's the definition well if you take a um, any dimension it has two properties it has orthogonality and it has direction these are two qualitative uh, parameters. Okay, there's just uh, direction and orthogonality. None of that is what is in the definition or the notion of dimension of mathematical physics. In mathematical physics, they say it's the number of numbers, number of coordinates. That's what a dimension is. And then they continue with the definition. What's the issue? The issue is that the definition that mathematics has, mathematical physics really, uh, has for dimensions, coordinate, and vectors have nothing to do with dimensions, coordinates, or vectors of physics. They are number lines. That's what they've defined. They define what a number line is. A number line does not have direction. A number line does not have orthogonality, perpendicularity with respect to anything, which is the opposite of what the physics one notion of, the, of this word not dimension is. What uh, the uh, notion of, phys of mathematical physics has is uh, you know, for number line, is that it just has magnitude, which is what the one in physics does not have. The one in physics is length, width, and height. They're qualitative. All they have is direction and orthogonality. The one in mathematical physics is not really a dimension coordinate or vector. It's really a number line. All it has is magnitude. Gotcha. And Thanks if, for if, if you look at, uh, if you put up number two, I'll ask uh, Jason there to put up number two. We can get a snapshot of what I just said. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, you can see the dimensions of physics. All they have is length, width, and height. Uh, in the case of coordinates, it's longitude, altitude, and latitude. And in the case of vectors, it's uh, depth, breadth, and elevation. In the case of dimensions, we're talking about um, orientation, tilt of an object. It's, uh, it's referenced with respect to the rest of the universe. The arrows go outwards. In, phys in, uh, in uh, physics, under physics coordinates, it has to do with locations. And the arrows point inwards towards the object from some reference point. And they're only qualitative. They just say, this is the location of this object, for example, with respect to the walls of your house, uh, for example, yeah. table. And in the case of vectors, it deals with motion. And, if, and again, the words are depth, breadth, and elevation. On the other hand, if you look at the math, I don't know if we can see the bottom of that. I yeah. only see the just top part down. of that. Uh, yeah, if you can raise that a little bit, the one for math. Uh, just give me a second. Maybe make it smaller. Yeah, yeah. that'd be. It's, it's showing up oddly on my screen. So let me try something different. Um, nope, that didn't work. <laughs> Making it smaller, maybe? Um, I'm sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop this and do a slightly different share. And that will probably help. Uh, yeah. Let me do desktop. All right, so we're not seeing the same one anymore. We want to see. Number two. There, there that one. Go. Okay. Yeah, there okay. you go. That's, cl that's close enough. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what, what we what we have here. This is Thanks. the third one, but it's okay. It's uh, more or less. Uh, I can go back. No, it's well, it's fine either way. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
this one anyways does, tells us anyways the same thing in a little more detail. You can see that uh, in mathematics, which are uh, mathematical physics, uh, really is mathematics, all they're talking about is ma magnitude. They are not talking about orthogonality, perpendicularity, or direction, which are qualitative notions, which is what the ones in physics have. And what the one in physics have uh, don't have is magnitude. Okay, so uh, the, the ones in math uh, have nothing to do with the ones in physics and vice versa. Why is this important? Well, because you, you probably heard in general relativity that time is deemed to be a dimension. In fact, it's supposed to be the fourth dimension, yeah. okay? And uh, what they're talking about is not a four dimensional object such as a tesseract is supposed or allegedly supposed to be. What they're really talking about is four number lines. They're saying you need these four numbers like a, um, you know, uh, to locate an object within space time. In other words, it's, it's like a circular argument. Uh, uh, an event is a point in space time. How do you locate it? Well, you need four numbers. You could uh, say it's a quadruplet, right? Um, that you need these four numbers, uh, which they say it's uh, longitude, la altitude, and latitude together with time to locate an object within space time. That's called an event. And the problem there also is, and I think uh, maybe I can tell you which one it is. I think it's four or five, the one that says event. I know the okay. next one down, I think. Oh, event, there we go, yeah. Yeah, okay. and, and see, uh, Stephen Hawking says an event is something that happens at a particular point, okay? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, a point is a location, it's a static concept. Happens is not a static concept, happens is a verb. And so we have a, a verb happening at a single point in time, at a single cross section of time, you could say, of, of the universal movie. So we have a problem because in order to have time or motion, you need at least two frames of the universal movie for something to move, for something to have time. And here they're talking about a point in time because they designate that point, in other words, time, with just one time. They can say 45 seconds or 1045 or whatever number they put in there. It's just one number and they see it as a cross section of time when, uh, of the universe, right? Of the universal movie when that's not the case. The case is that you need two points in time, uh, two points to designate time. You need at least two locations yeah. to designate mm -hmm. motion, to designate time. And so they have this, this notion that the fourth dimension is time when they're not even talking about dimensions, at least not the ones of physics, not, not one that refers to an object. So they can't say, well, I'm going to illustrate or I'm going to try to illustrate or I can't imagine this four-dimensional object. Of course you can't because you're not talking about an object. You're talking about locating something within space-time, which is a totally different concept than saying, try to imagine this object. Okay, so, so we have these differences between mathematical physics and qualitative physics, genuine physics. Physics, we try to explain a phenomenon, and these people are not, uh, these people don't have a, an explanation for the physics, for what's going on in the universe. All they have is descriptions, mathematical descriptions for how things move. Those are two separate things. And I think that's where we have a divorce between genuine physics and mathematical physics. Awesome, real interesting. And, uh... Before I let Jason comment, I don't yeah. want to lose the moment. I want to go into another question that's similarly related because I think it's interesting and it might help build a better foundation for Jason to come up with some more questions. So uh, here's my question, Bill. So 3D objects have length, width, and height. We see and interact with them every day, but that is all that is 3D. Images and dreams only have the illusion of 3D, and even 3D video games are in 2D, but the shapes and depth illusions make the game look like 3D. There are also no such things as a 3D point. All points have at least a little bit of length and are 2D. You know, like if I imagine a 2D point, you know, it has length and width, no height. <coughs> and um, the only thing, quote unquote, that is one dimensional would be a, the very tip of a really sharp pencil. Which brings us to a good point, pun intended. Is a 1D, is 1D a standalone principle or can it be imagined only if there is length? In other words, can I just imagine one D alone? Well, I think we have to go back all the way to Euclid <laughs> to answer this question, uh, the set of questions that you asked. Uh, we go back to Euclid and he defined a point as that which has no part, okay? It, uh, that's the translation, whether we understand it the way he did, I don't know. But essentially he was saying, look, you don't need a dimension to designate a point. 
And, and the question is, are we talking about whether the point itself is a physical entity that has length, width, and height, two, two dimensions, one dimensions, or none at all, or are we talking about how to locate a point within something else, which is a separate issue, okay? Mm -hmm. So we're talking about two, two different things here. And, and the, the issue here is that we, we haven't changed that definition in what, 2000 uh, plus years, okay? W what happens is we have the point, we have the line, which we say is one dimensional, but obviously they're not talking about a physical object because there is no object that is one dimensional that you can even imagine. So the zero yeah. D point that we have today, supposedly, right? And the one D line are not, they're not, the, um, uh, what is it? They're not geometric figures. A figure is 2D or 3D. Yeah, it's, it's not, not, it's not yeah, less it's than that, it's not more than that. You cannot have a four dimensional figure and you cannot have a one or, or, a, or a zero dimensional figure. No such monster. Because what are you gonna put? Uh, just length? Well, please draw it. And whatever you draw is gonna have at least two dimensions. Yeah, so, so, we, so we're going to have a problem between the architecture, the, the, the structure that we're, talk, we're referring to using the words length, width, and height on the one hand, and on the other, the fact that, you know, we're, we're talking about how to locate a point somewhere. And for that, you know, I, I distinguish between the, the, the uh, coordinates, because now we're talking about location, it's going to be coordinates. I distinguish between uh, longitude, latitude, and altitude. From, uh, and I think it's number four there, uh, where um, you'll see that we have a sphere, and they're not talking anymore about longitude, altitude, and, and uh, the, the third one, uh, latitude, <laughs> altitude, and longitude. They're talking about radius, uh, meridian. Meridian. And, and, I'm sorry? Uh, yeah, radius, meridian, and parallel? Yeah, and, uh, and, uh, and no, and the other one was, what is it, parallel? Yeah, parallel, meridian, and radius. These are number lines. These are number lines. Uh, the reason they can curve them is because they're not, <laughs> they're not really dimensions because they lack this orthogonality as soon as you curve them. And so they calculate angles because that's what they're interested in. And they curve the, these uh, coordinates. And what they're really referring to is number lines, which again, have no direction. They're talking about numbers, okay? Yeah. And so we distinguish that from the ones in physics. Okay. And so... Would you say that, I think I remember reading one of your You Stupid Relevist um, uh, web pages on your site, and then you said, I believe that the only thing that is one dimensional is like the very tip of a pencil. Is that correct? Or what do you mean? Well, no, uh, if I said that, I must have been joking. No, there, there's really nothing that is zero or one dimensional. Uh, everything, everything is either two or three dimensional, okay? Whether it's a drawing you know, whether it's a pixel on a screen, whatever thing you can imagine, you know, we're talking about uh, something which is, if, if you can image it, you're talking about these two or three dimensions. Okay, that's what I thought. Yeah, and there's nothing you can't outside imagine of one D alone. No, of without, course. Yeah, there, without a little bit of length. And, and like, again, uh, just to give a comment, I actually talked with Jason Thibodeau about, uh, what's his name, Carl Sagan and uh, the Flatlander example and the problems of it. And like even kind of, and Carl Sagan kind of emits a little bit of defeat because he's like, you know, like these little cards here that represent the Flatlanders, they have a little bit of height to them, but we'll just pretend that they don't have height. But if they didn't have height, how could you have motion? Like, how could he be, he couldn't be moving anything, you know? And so it's like, he kind of had like a false kind of starting point already, you know? And then he like, you know, he said like, I can't like, you know, there's back and forth and then there's up and down in our uh, universe, but then there's other directions <laughs> that are mutually perpendicular to that. I, I can't show you what, what that is. And it's like, right. you know, well, so, I mean, that was interesting. Yeah. So yeah, thanks for pointing that out, Bill. That's uh, kind of like what I was thinking about. Like, cause like, you know, you know, like, and we were talking, uh, me and Jason about like, hypothetically speaking, if you had 2D Flatlanders, and I brought up the point that if they were to imagine something in their universe, couldn't they only imagine things in 1D? And like, but then like, that's impossible because you can't just imagine one dimension. There has to be a little bit, at least a little bit of length to give it, you know, like, you know, character so you can imagine. It's like the whole starting premise of like the Flatlanders being able to exist was just off. So yeah, so thanks for clarifying that, Bill. And then, uh, so I'll just let Jason chime in. I'm sure he has some questions and then uh, we'll move on from there. Okay, thanks, Ed. Um, so one question I have, I guess I have a couple, two or three questions. One is um, if dimension is something that has directionality and orthogonality, orthogonality. Yeah, orthogonality. Uh, does that mean I, that, I mean, that kind of just rules out time as a dimension, doesn't of it? Because 
because it seems like, I mean, we talk about the direction of time, but I take it that's not direction in the relevant sense. Um, right, so there, there is no direction because whenever they talk about the so-called, and I'll use quotations on that, whenever they talk about the direction of time, what, what they're really talking about is forward. They say time moves forward, but forward is not a direction because your forward is a little different direction than my forward. <laughs> so mm -hmm. what do you mean time flows forward? And again, they use that word forward and they think they answer the question of direction when in fact time has no direction because time is simply a counting of numbers. Also, that's all it is. All we're doing is adding numbers on the clock you know, as, as a little hand goes around it. All we're doing is adding numbers. Time has no direction. And, and it's so funny when they do their space time diagrams, you know, Mr. Feynman, and he's got time, go, he replaces height essentially with time. He says he's replacing the word space for the other three di dimensions. They, he puts them all together in this one horizontal uh, arrow. And so he's got time going perpendicular to space, which makes no sense whatsoever because uh, time has no direction. So I, I have some questions about the implications of this for our understanding of modern physics, which I'm sure you're gonna to get to. Um, so let me ask a different a question that's not directly connected to that, at least not right away, not immediately. And that is that um, one of the issues that, that uh, Ed and I were talking about was whether there could be, there even could be a dimension that is orthogonal to the other three spatial dimensions. Um, and so I wonder I, just what you, what you would have to say about that, because I mean, it's one issue about whether time is a dimension, but there's a separate question about whether there are other spatial dimensions, or at least possibly other spatial dimensions than the three uh, that we've been talking about. Yeah, so he's talking about whether a 4D tesseract could exist. Like, out yeah, yeah, there. okay. I, I understand the question. This, this is my, my answer to that. I have to give you an explanation of how this universe works. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to explain gravity to you. I'm going to try to explain magnetism or electricity to you. I have no use for this fourth dimension at all, but, uh, but let's assume there is one out there. If I cannot present it to you, if I cannot show you in any way what I'm talking about, I'm just telling you, you know, there's a fourth perpendicular dimension, uh, which is perpendicular to length, width, and height. You know, I'm talking about bunnies, uh, you know, I'm talking about Alice in Wonder. I'm not even talking about that. I'm talking about irrationality because I cannot, I cannot even show you what I'm talking about. I mean, if you ask me about God, I can say, look, uh, here's God. And I bring uh, an image of uh, God, the one that, um, you know, the painters in the 16th century painted on, you know, their, uh, all these artists that painted God in different ways. I'll bring that and say, look, this is God. Okay, that's my God, and that's the one I show you. And you say, okay, I know what you mean by God, by the word God. I cannot do this with a fourth dimension. I cannot bring you the fourth dimension and say, look, this is what I mean by the fourth dimension. What am I going to show you? Yeah. <laughs> I okay, cannot present I... anything that's fourth dimensional. So, so I could, and this is what I mean, and this is what Sagan said in that video is, yeah, I can't show you it, but I can define it. I can say that it is a dimension that is at 90 degrees to the other three. Except, uh -huh. except. Except, yeah, but he's got a problem, Mr. Sagan here, because what he's doing, he's, he's talking about structure. And structure we do not define, Sub, uh, structure we point to. In other words, an object, like you say, what's a table? Or you want to tell the Klingon, you want to teach him your language. So you say, look, the word table, what is a table? Well, a table is that, and you point to it. And you say, okay, what's a chair? That's a chair, that's a rock, that's a tree. You point and name. That's the way you present a structure. But Carl Sagan can't come in here and say, look, I can't point to it, but let me define it for you. Let me tell you what a table is. No, no, you first point to a structure, then you can define and say, well, it's got four legs, a platform, whatever. But you can, first you gotta point to, the, uh, uh, to objects. You do not define objects. We define concepts, not objects. And see, so he's, he's getting mixed up between his concepts and his objects. Objects we point to, concepts we define. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so um, my other questions do have to do with m more related to, to physics. Um, so I don't know how much, maybe if you say you're going to get to this in a minute, then that's fine. But so one, one question I have is, what about, what about singularities? Um, it seems like your view would be they don't exist, they're not real. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, singularity is a mathematical concept. And the, uh, one of the problems is that they have invented a word 
that is an irrational term. And that's a word infinitesimal. Okay, it's an irrational term, but mathematicians love it because what they use is this as X approaches zero, the limit as X approaches zero. And so the question is that infinitesimal is both zero and approaching zero. In other words, infinitesimal means the state, you being at the station and you getting closer and closer to the station. Okay, yeah, that's the notion. So, so they use the word infinitesimal to give you the notion, the feeling that something is becoming so small that we're not going to talk about it anymore. You know, uh, you know what I mean? It's getting small. So is the singularity infinitesimal or is it zero? Is it zero volume or is it approaching a point where it's becoming a zero volume? And, and uh, I've got, the, if you look at number, I think it's six or six, I think it is, uh, Hawking. Yeah, here. Uh, Chandrasekhar calculated that a black hole, which at its center has a singularity, is zero dimensional. Okay, he, he, he calculated, he got the equation. He was rejected by his boss at the time, which was uh, Arthur Eddington. And uh, Einstein himself, here you can see um, Hawking's own words, Einstein himself wrote a paper in which he claimed that stars would not shrink to zero size. Zero size, that means they all understood what Chandrasekhar was saying. He was saying that the, the so-called black hole becomes a singularity, a zero nothing. All that matter that the star had uh, was uh, compressed into zero volume with infinite uh, density. So, so we got a problem because these people are saying, look, there's nothing there. We have an infinitesimal singularity, meaning that it's getting closer and closer to zero, but not quite zero volume. And so they, they play around with this. They give you the impression that there's a dot there called a singularity when there is no dot. The singularity is zero dimensional. In other words, there's nothing there. That's the definition of nothing. <laughs> because on top of that, we crush matter out of existence. You know, by doing so, but this, the so-called black hole, its pressure is so great that it crushed all matter out of existence. Mass is a measure of the quantity of matter. There is no matter in a black hole because it was all completely crushed out of existence. We have a zero dimensional singularity that has nothing in it because all matter has been crushed out of existence, has no mass. That seems like the definition of nothing. So, <laughs> can you, so on your view then, what is going on both with black holes and also at the Big Bang? Well, first of all, I don't think there was a big bang. I don't think you can create it. And, and this can be resolved easily with just definition. We do not need to carry out any tests. We do not go have to travel backward in time to find out what happened 13 billion years ago. All we have to do is define our terms. We say that an object, a thing, okay, is that which has shape. Nothing, space, is that which doesn't have shape. There are antonyms. Something is the opposite of nothing something that which has shape, nothing that which doesn't have shape. With those two definitions, we can easily uh, show that you cannot convert something into nothing and you cannot morph nothing into something. So matter has always been there. There, has, there was no moment of creation. There was no singularity that started at all with or without God, because even if we put God, you would have to explain how God created that singularity or whatever first piece of matter. You know, what, what is the mechanism? And if you cannot conceptualize the mechanism of something arising completely out of nothing, length, width, and height, suddenly uh, uh, spontaneously coming into being, if you cannot tell me what the process is, what the mechanism is, then we don't, well, then it's an irrational theory, no matter how you look at it. So the first thing we have to reject is Big Bang. Black hole, that's a separate issue. I'm saying it's a magnetic phenomenon and I, I wish I would have known the question because uh, I have a very, uh, uh, several videos, in fact, where I illustrate what is causing that phenomenon we call a black hole. And I'll just try to explain it here as best as possible. If you put a charge, okay, we'll call it a charge, in a magnetic field, okay, magnetic field is coming down, that charge, let's assume it's a ball, ball-shaped charge, will roll around in a spiral inside that so-called magnetic field, whatever magnetic field is. And I'm saying that's what a black hole is, is that phenomena is happening. Uh, when people focus and see that a star is orbiting around nothing, and they say, oh, there must be a very heavy mass in the center of that circle, of that circular motion. 
I'm saying what's really happening is the magnetic field of the entire galaxy is in that region coming down on a very, remember all stars are charged. They're, they're, they are all magnetic. And so I think that what's happening is the star is revolving around at great speeds around absolutely nothing because it has this magnetic field of the entire galaxy impinging down upon it. So that's my explanation for the black hole phenomenon. There is no black hole. Is there, but okay, that's interesting because it seems consistent with what you've said on this slide that, that, that you could get matter extremely dense, just not infinitely dense. Correct. I mean, how much are we going to press this thing? And, and what kind of matter is that last bit of matter that we squash the entire universe into the size of an atom or smaller? I mean, what is that? Uh, <laughs> what kind of matter is that? <laughs> right. So, but I mean, I mean, is it, I don't, I mean, I'm, I'm very uh, ignorant <laughs> of physics, but is it that, I mean, so you were, when you were talking about black holes, you were talking about I think the black hole, supposed black hole, um, on your view, that's at the center of the galaxy, but there are also non-galactic non, you know, black holes that aren't at the center, right? There are other types of black holes. So I guess my question is, could you get, could you get matter that's so dense that it would behave in a way that is similar to the behavior? In other words, that was the matter is so dense that light couldn't escape. Is that possible on your view? No, it's not possible because uh, according to my proposal, which I don't know if you can see this, you see that rope? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I'm saying light is a rope, has the shape of a rope. In other words, the mediator of light is a rope. It's a torsion moving along a rope in both directions. So a rope connects any two atoms in the universe. Every atom in the universe is connected physically connected to all others. And because of that, light always travels from one atom to the other at a different frequency, a different wavelength, but always travels from one atom to another. And with that setup, it's totally different what the mathematicians are saying, which they say, look, the universe is just a bunch of loose particles, disconnected particles, individual discrete particles, and these particles are smashed together into this thing we call a black hole. And so now we have this black hole, supposedly this object uh, in the middle of nowhere between two galaxies, for example. And it's got all this matter crushed into a singularity, whatever a singularity is. And it's just infinite density or almost infinite density and almost uh, no volume. Uh, so uh, what they're talking about is something they cannot see, they cannot touch meaning they'll never be able to prove what they're talking about. They cannot even conceptualize it because all they're talking about is math. They're saying there's a lot of mass in a very small area. That's essentially what their, their whole theory. They're saying there's a bunch of mass in a small area. It used to be a star. Now it's a little uh, singularity, which we'll call a black hole. And anything that gets close to it, it gets sucked in. But they cannot tell you what the mechanism is. For example, if I have a singularity, and I have its event horizon, which is what a black hole is, a singularity with its uh, uh, globular, you know, its uh, spherical event horizon. Okay, so let, let's concede the assumption. Let's say that there is such an object in the universe. Now we're going to have another star, which is outside uh, or close to that, that black hole. We have this star there. How, by what mechanism, physical mechanism, does the star pull matter or the entire star into the black hole by what I mean does it throw a lasso uh, what's the physical mechanism and they will not give you a physical mechanism they'll just say the mass is so great that it attracts it but see mass is, is a mathematical concept they haven't given me a mechanism uh, of how the black hole attracted the star if I want to attract a, a donkey I put a rope around its neck and pull on it we all understand that but if you say look my mass attracts the, the donkey. And you say, well, by what mechanism? And we call that black magic. <laughs> That's what it is, black magic. <laughs> mass did it. Okay, so, then, so <laughs> where does that leave gravity? Well, gra uh, gravity, again, you can conceptualize it if every atom in the universe is, uh, I don't know, can you see my two fists here? I don't know. If I'm yeah, we got. Okay, yeah. imagine my two fists are my are two atoms. Okay, 
and they're connected by a rope, physical rope. This is a physical, this is not energy, this is not field, this is not wave, this is a rope, okay? A, two, a, two, a pair of tra um, uh, uh, twined strands, okay? So if everything in the universe is physically interconnected, if every atom is physically connected to every other atom, now we can begin to understand action at a distance because there is no real action at a distance. The reason the Milky Way pulls on the Andromeda galaxy is because, you know, these two things, every atom in one galaxy is connected, physically connected to every atom in the other galaxy. So now we can start, you know, to understand action at a distance, gravity. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, that seems like a radically... Oh, yeah. <laughs> different. I mean, so, so, <laughs> yeah. so I have a, a, a sociological question, I guess. I mean, so are, <laughs> are, are, you, are you a lone voice crying out in the wilderness, or are there others yeah. who... Well, are, yeah, we're uh, <laughs> 10, ten uh, crazy guys, essentially. You know, I came up with this uh, theory in 1998, and since then, there are some people who subscribe to it they like it they try they, they are researching it but obviously this is not this has not hit the mainstream even though i published a couple papers uh on the subject it's uh it's one of those where it, it never got any highlighted in anywhere and so you know this is the status quo uh after 20 years <laughs> uh you know it's not out there it's just for those people who are lucky enough to come to my site hear it and at least they get another vision of the universe whether they believe it or not it's not a question of belief. It's a question of understanding. It's a question of, look, we're proposing something different. And you look at it and you understand it, and then you reach your own conclusion. That's the way we look at it. Um, earlier, you said that we were talking about the direction of time, and you talked about that that is uh, nonsense, that time doesn't have a direction. Yeah. Um, and so I guess one thought that I had about that is that would imply that any question about related to that so i take it like my understanding of physics is that it is an open question and that physicists treat it as an open question why is it that time goes in one direction and not the other <laughs> and you're saying that's just a completely misconceived that's not even a real question and, is that and right? let, me, let me tell you why uh, or one of the underlying problems with that no one in the last three thousand years has defined the word time no one can tell you what time is. Some people say it's what a time, what a clock measures. Uh, they have all diff different uh, uh, notions of what time is. Nobody bothers defining it. They just say, look, uh, let's deal with the seconds, with the minutes, with the years. And uh, let me tell you that if one twin travels faster than the other, well, he'll have a different age than, the, and than his brother and stuff like that. In other words, they reach conclusion. They never define the word time. And, and so what I had to do was define the word time, even though we do not use the word time in physics, uh, they use it in mathematical physics, not in physics. Physics, we have no use for time, but I had to define what these people were referring to. And I'm saying time is a comparison of two motions. You need memory in order to have time. Without memory, you cannot have time. So any animal, for example, a lion that has memory, they have a conception of time, a rudimentary conception of time. And again, all you need is two motions. Once you compare one motion against another motion, you have time. And so once you have that, then it's meaningless to talk about direction or to even use uh, numerical time to, uh, to do anything other than describe uh, the motion of something. We have no use to, I, I cannot use time to explain anything, any mechanism in the universe. Bill, let me interject. I have, a, I have an interesting question. All right. So there's people who say like, you know, they'll say like, if I were to give you a chocolate bar after an infinite amount of time, would you ever get the chocolate bar? Obviously not. So they'll say that like the, uni the universe, like if you have eternal matter, it couldn't have existed for an infinite amount of time. Like if you say it, if you say it always existed, that that would be implying that it would it would have existed for an infinite amount of time, which is nonsensical. And there had to be a point in time where it was created. And and so like I want to know like what you would think about this. And I think I have uh, I have a suggestion to help solve this paradox. And you can tell me if it's valid or not. Um, like when we say that, and like let's just say there was an object, whether it's a god or a leprechaun or, or like an asteroid, if it existed, it was eternally existent. It, 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 it never uh, was created. It was always there. 
When you say something was always there, that's not akin to saying it existed for an infinite amount of ticks on a clock. It, it, it's like, you know, and it's just like, and if, you know, I think you say that, you know, things were always moving. There was never a time when something was stationary and then move. Things were always moving. Well, is that saying that if you're saying things are always moving, are you, aren't you implying that things were moving for an infinite amount of time? No, it's not the same thing. And like, I kind of have like uh, a suggestion, like, and at every point in the universal frame, in the universal movie, when you have an object moving, even in a single point of reference, gravity is is pulling on it. There's something active going on, even in one frame of the universal movie, even if you don't get to the other frame. Gravity is always pulling on it. So there's always something going on, even in a single frame. So that's how you can have an object always moving, yet that doesn't mean that you're implying that it's moving for an infinite amount of time. What, do you, what would you have to say about that? Okay, uh, I'm going to correct you on two, two things there. The first one is this last thing that you said. You cannot have motion in a single frame of the universal movie because you're talking about, to put it in these terms, a cross-section of time. Cross-section mm -hmm. of time means that all you have is location. Location mm -hmm. is a static concept. All you have is distance between <laughs> objects. It's like if Mother Nature or Father Universe suddenly chopped the time and everything just stands still. You know, like in the, I think uh, there was a uh, Twilight Zone version of that where everything just stands still. And that's how you have to conceptualize. Not even an electron is moving within a photograph. Okay, the, okay. the photograph the, is a single frame in the movie. Uh, if you look at that frame, there's nothing moving in there. Conceptually, there's nothing moving. And so, uh, no, you, don't ha you do not have gravity in the sense of motion. You have gravity in what I explain as weight. Weight is a static concept. Weight is location specific. You have weight for a given okay. location with respect to the Earth. So if we were to freeze the astronaut falling to Earth, right? Let's say we freeze the image. He has a certain weight there. He still has, yeah. okay. okay. Yeah, right. now, now if, if we freeze the frame, uh, say a minute later, so we have two frames, one frame one minute earlier, one frame a minute later, that astronaut is going to weigh differently with respect to the Earth. Why? What's happened is the number of ropes that from every one of his atoms of his body, right? Every atom in his body is connected to every atom of the earth. That's the assumption. As he approaches the earth, the ropes um, fan out. When they fan out, those that were on the same axis are no longer on the same axis. You have more what I call effective ropes. So in a sense, you're right. In a sense, you're wrong. There is no motion. But you would have, for example, different weight, right. okay, different that's... number of ropes in a single picture that you would get in the universal movie. Okay. Now okay. let me get to the, let me get you to the other question. The other issue is your word infinite. Infinite is an irrational term. It should never be used on planet Earth. Okay. Yeah. Go to the land of the Klinger. Infinite is an adjective. Adjectives can, oh, in physics, not in ordinary speech, okay, or in mathematical physics. In, in, yeah, in, yeah, in science, in physics, you can only use adjectives to qualify objects. You cannot say infinite motion, infinite time. That's an irrational statement in physics. Uh, objects are finite. All objects are finite. They have a, a shape. Therefore, they, they're all finite in that sense. An infinite object is an irrational term because you've defined objects that which is finite and now you're saying an infinite finite you see what i'm saying if yeah. it's infinite that means you cannot see its shape yeah and if you cannot see its shape then you cannot even talk about an object you got to show the shape of an object in order to talk about an object so i just want to clarify that on the infinite now uh the basic question was what the, the as you started out your 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 talk there what was it yeah so the question is if an object First, always existed okay and if okay. motion yeah. okay, okay. Got I, got it. I, got it. I just <laughs> had to be fine. okay uh let me blow your mind out and and for this you're gonna need a beer okay to listen to this okay i, I want you to get a beer real quick from your fridge because you're really gonna need it close enough there, got some bye there, <laughs> there was never a first human in the universe let me repeat that there was never a first you, uh, human in the universe. What do I mean by that? I'm saying if we go a million years, two million years to another side of the universe, we would probably find humans developed in that planet. Okay? Uh, we can conceive this. It's very likely that we're not the only life in the universe. We're probably not the only humans in the universe. Okay? Somewhere, maybe the conditions were ripe for there to be a planet like the Earth 
where humans eventually evolved from in, in that planet, okay? A million years before that, some other place in the universe, there must have been another planet like that one, like the Earth, where humans developed. A million years before that, some other place in the universe, and so on down the line, all the way to nowhere. The notion that there's a beginning to things is a very human um you know, notion, a widespread notion, babies are born. We say, well, this is when he was born. This is when he came into existence. He was created. He was born. The, the universe was not born. You know, father universe is eternal in that sense. It's very hard for us to conceptualize that because we say, what do you mean? It, it existed forever. Who made it? You know, nobody made it. No, it, it just there. It's uh, all matter has been there because matter cannot convert into space and space cannot convert into matter. So, yeah. so and, and because space is that which has no shape, matter has no place to go. It cannot cross a line that says, oh, I'm going to leave space. It can't because space is not a container. Space is not right. infinite. Space is nothing, which means that which has no shape. Not even mm -hmm. God can escape space because he's got no boundary Rather to escape, cross. Yeah. He yeah. has no boundary to cross. And so, yeah, it's very hard to, for us to understand uh, eternal, uh, forever. Uh, but again, time is a notion that we've invented. Uh, Father Universe doesn't understand time. Okay, get it now. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Jason. When you talk about human beings living on other planets, I, 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 I think there's a way of taking that, which maybe you don't intend. Okay. I want to clarify. You don't mean that there are homo sapiens living on other planets. You mean that there are other intelligent creatures that we would call persons, but they're not in the biological sense of human being, we mean a descendant of other human beings. And that species evolved on Earth, and it's very unlikely, and I guess even biologically impossible for the same species to evolve with a different evolutionary history. And so what you would get on what you would have on other planets aren't beings that have our evolutionary history, no matter how much they're like us, since they don't share our evolutionary history, they're not human beings. I don't I so I, I just want to clarify you you weren't saying that there would be literal homo sapiens on other planets. I have a theory and I've got it in writing. If intelligence like ours arose on another planet, those people look exactly like us. There can be no other form for intelligence, the maximum intelligence that the universe can create except us. The planet has to have certain parameters. It would have to be a certain distance from its star. It would have to have a certain size, certain gravity, a certain tilt, a certain magnetism, right? And once it has all these things, it's inevitable, the way I look at it, for that planet to evolve. If it's going to evolve intelligence like ours, like if we could go to that planet, we would see people like us. It can't be any other way. Could that's, they have, that's my theory. Could they have pointy ears? Uh, there could be different characteristics, but in general, they would look more or less like us. Interesting. And um, uh, I've got, I would have to see, there's more, this, this takes up an hour, another hour at least, but yeah. all I'm saying is, I'm just giving you my point of view. My point of view is that anywhere in the universe where intelligence of our level arose, the humans over there look more or less like us. Okay. I don't like, like, you know, I don't I think like, they would be green. <laughs> <laughs> I, I also, also had a question about infinity and you were making the point I took I take you to have been making the point that there's nothing like infinity doesn't apply to physical objects, but what about mathematical things? Are there, you know, there are mathematicians who don't think <laughs> that infinity is a concept that should be used in pure mathematics. So in other words, and so they don't, they would not, they would reject the idea that there are an infinite number of natural numbers. Um, yeah, yeah, because the question is, I mean, some people like Cantor, George Cantor, and um, uh, there was another German guy, escaped my mind right now, uh, and they, they did a lot of studies on infinities, and it's all numbers in the end, it's, you know, it's, um, it, what are we talking about when we're saying infinite, are we talking about counting infinitely, are we talking about dividing between two numbers infinitely, you know, what do we mean? And, you know, if you go all the way to Aristotle, they talked about, you know, infinity. It was something that really concerned them. Like, you know, how many points are between two points, you know, between two numbers? And they figured out that you could put as many numbers as you want, as long as you keep adding more and more decimal yeah, points. Yeah, it's like the Grim Reaper, Reaper paradox, kind of. Yeah. yeah it's, I... uh, 
It's it's the, the, like the hotel. What is it? The Hilbert's Hotel. Hilbert's Hotel. Hilbert's That's hotel. the other guy I was thinking of. Hilbert. Uh, you know, he, he talked about uh, infinities as well. All these people just are mathematicians who like to play around with numbers. And what they they did, they they're talking about concepts. You know, concepts. Yeah, dreams. We we can have a million of those. You know, infinite ones if you want if you want to use the word. But when you're talking about physics, the word infinity has no place in it. Because first, there are not infinite objects, there are not infinite sized uh, or infinite, in other words, an object cannot be infinite, you cannot have infinite number of objects, and the space is not infinite because space is not a thing. Space is mm -hmm. nothing. That space is that which does not have shape, therefore you cannot talk about the infinity of space. You can talk about the infinity of a horse, which would make no sense because all courses are finite and so on. Yeah. Are there yeah, the language correctly? In other words, are there such things as moments? <laughs> I don't know, but there are definitely such things as minutes, right? <laughs> well, not things. Well, <laughs> what do you mean by things? Events, <laughs> yeah, like there's a there's moment. That, there's, I mean, like I can. So there are instances, concepts. Of, there are certainly instances of counting, right? Where where I'm counting from one to sixty. Uh huh. Now I don't think that. So take that, that is an interval of time, right? The, the time it takes me from, to count from one to 60, call that a minute. Are, is it, if, if there's no beginning of the universe, isn't that equivalent to saying that there are an infinite number of minutes? Yeah, that's what I was getting at. Yeah, like, cause it's like, remember Bill, how you were talking about, like go a million years before there was humans, go a million years, but like it seems like you were playing like an infinite or incessant regress, so there would always be that. But it's like, is, yeah, isn't that saying that there was no beginning? I mean, isn't didn't there have to be a beginning to everything? <laughs> like to the, to the humans and millions of years later. See, like it started. Like, well, well, you know I mean? let, let, let me give you two, a couple answers to your to both of your concerns. The first one is the following. Let, uh, I'm saying that this is the entire universe. Okay, it's a uh, I hope you can see that. Yeah. OK, it's a closed loop thread. That's all there is in the universe. Closed loop thread, you can say in space, within space, even though the space is not a container. OK, it just, but this is all there is, just floating out there. Yeah. Now, okay. this, this single thread converts into the ropes that um, uh, bind any two atoms. And the atoms themselves are made of the same thread. So it's all a single thread, the whole thing. Now, and, they, I asked, and, and you're saying, hold on, you're saying the ropes eternally, they were always there, never created. And let me, let me sh show you this. Uh, I give you this, okay, uh, uh, Ed, and you start here, you start here, and you, you begin going all around every atom in the universe, through every row, through every thread, and you're going to come back to here. Yeah. Uh, if you look at the whole thing, it's just a single object. It's just a single thread, closed loop yeah. thread. And so there is no infinity in, in the sense of the, there's only one object. The infinity is in your mind who is doing the running around, the measuring or the experiencing by going from one end to the other. But the universe is laughing at you because saying all he did was go around a thread that's existing in, in, uh, in, in the present tense, so to speak. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? There's only a single object, which is this thread, and it's there it's like it's always yeah. present it's always in present mode in that sense it's always infinite in time or eternal in time okay uh, yeah I see but it's saying. a single thread it's it's like you know i uh, i can have a a ball in the middle of space that if, as as long as no one touches it maybe that ball stays there forever and you say well how much time has gone by well the ball doesn't know the ball says i'm always in the present yeah, see, that's the thing, because it's like, okay, I understand, like, okay, yeah, so you're saying the ropes were eternally existent, matter is eternal, okay, I got that, so it's like, that's a, a, the thing that people have their, their, have a hard time wrapping their mind around, so you're saying, okay, the thread, all the threads were always there, okay, so isn't that saying they were there for an infinite amount, it was there for an infinite amount of time, and you're saying no. That's and, always and in so, the present, the infinite it's always, is yeah, present. Like, I kinda, okay, so like, <laughs> the okay. The amount then, of time is always the present. Let me, okay. let me put, yeah, go ahead, Jason. maybe put it in a different way suppose i think about what i call the future okay and i'm and and, and suppose i take a, a magic potion and i become immortal 
contrary to fact. And I, <laughs> and I just keep going. A wizard hat. <laughs> uh, what would I experience a million, it, my, by my counting, a million, 10 million, a billion years, 10 billion years, what would that, what would I see? All you would do, all you would be doing is again, uh, you know, those little drawings where they have a little man made out of, uh, it's a stick man, you know, it's, and he's made out of one line only. And the line then goes around, turns into some kind of circle or whatever. And so the, the little man, this, this uh, stick man is the same thing as the little circle he's going around in. And so he's losing his leg, but creating a new leg forward because it's the same uh, thread, so to speak. And that's what you would be doing. If you're, it, it, here's you going around, you know, the thread, you're made out of threads. Okay, every atom in your body is made out of threads. You would be rolling around the universe eternally, I guess, okay. and going from one end of the universe to the other, and the thread is you yourself. So the thread is, is, is taking a shape from one region of the thread to another. That's all you're doing as an infinite human being. So I guess part of what I'm thinking is that the, the circle metaphor makes me think about eternal recurrence. And I'm wondering, <laughs> I, I, what you just said makes me think that's not what you meant. You don't no. mean that, okay. I'm saying, I'm saying that, we, that the thread is always in the present. And as far as the thread is concerned, let's call them father universe, like I like to call this thread. The thread is in the, in the present, always in the present. Different parts of its body, you know, the atoms over there, the galaxy over there, the star in the other direction, all those are part of this single thread that uh, is in space, that's floating out there in space. And it itself, the universe itself, is always in the present tense. It doesn't know it itself, Father Universe himself, he doesn't know what the past is or what the future is. He's always in the present. In that sense, he's eternal. Okay, Bill. All right. So I think we're getting to the heart of the matter here. Let me give you a question that will make it even uh, easier uh, to understand, because I know this is like a complicated issue. Okay, so I yeah, can understand is. the ropes eternally existing. Okay. Was there ever a point when the ropes went from non-motion to motion, or is motion also eternal? The motion, I believe, is eternal. Any, any like we cannot conceptualize nothing becoming something in the same way we cannot conceptualize the beginning of motion. Why would, why would something that is inanimate, right? Let's, let's remove God for a second, right? Okay. Something that is inanimate like this thread, if it's standing still one part with respect to the other floating in the universe, what would get one part of this thread to move for the first time? You would need some kind of external input, you know, and we're yeah, discounting that. Like so, what moved so, it? Yeah. So yeah. So so we have this issue with with God that people analyze in the past, you know, which is is he the prime mover? Is God the prime mover? And and so people say, well, who moved God? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we get to this re recursive thing where you know you say, well, who moved God? And how did God come into being? Well, he had a mother. I don't know, you know. <laughs> or they say he's eternal. So well, again, well, well, you, you end up with eternity no matter what. Yeah. So, but, but like, uh, so you're saying, okay, so you have non-motion, then you have motion. How do we get from there? Um, wouldn't it be like, wouldn't it be the pull of the ropes? Like here, it's like in frame one, you have non-motion because the rope is pulling, but it has yet to pull it to the second frame. And then and then finally, when the pulling has fully commenced, now we have the second frame of the universal movie movie where you have a one location of an object and now it's at a different location. So wouldn't it be the pull of the ropes? That makes it go from non-motion to motion. You say, when you say pull, you're already using a verb. You're saying, um, okay, what caused the pull? I mean, wait, the dog can pull on me. But, uh, <laughs> what about the torsion and the weights? No, the same thing. You cannot you cannot conceptualize the origin of motion. You simply cannot. Okay, uh, I see what you're saying. Okay, so then, okay, so motion always motion like existence is eternal. So it's right. like okay, motion. I think it's a little more problem with motion because you're saying, you're saying motion is eternal. There's always been motion. Yeah. And then someone says, so are you saying that the ropes moved an infinite amount of locations? You would say no. <laughs> so then, but then it's like okay, you're saying no to that, but then it's like. How is that true if there's always motion? Because you think motion, you're like, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six. You know, like how would you explain that? That it's not infinite motion, yet there's always been motion. 
it, it, again, we, let's get rid of the word infinite. That word is dangerous, okay? Yeah, infinite yeah. is the wrong word. We're talking about eternal. You can use eternal. You can say constant, stuff like that, which are adverbs in the context of physics, okay? So, so you have this uh, thread, okay, out there. It's always been there. It's always in the present tense as far as it's concerned. But there is motion between in different parts of the thread because this thread forms atoms over there, atoms over there, and atoms in the other place. And these atoms turn into stars, they turn into galaxies, etc. So you have these galaxies in throughout the, the, the universe, okay? They're all in motion. You cannot conceptualize one of these beginning to move for the first time, or even, I cannot even conceptualize uh, the thread being untied completely so that you get this, and vice versa. I cannot conceptualize this converting into that. In other words, I don't think the universe at some point disentangled itself completely and formed a, a uh, closed loop thread and then came back at, you know, some, some, something like an oscillating universe where it turns into the thread and the thread turns into all the matter in the universe. I don't think that ever happened. I think it's always been like what we see out there. The, today we see the same thing that if you came back a gazillion years ago or come in the future, a gazillion years in the future, you would see the same universe. Essentially, the, the stars might change. Maybe this star is over here in someplace else with respect to other stars, because again, the relation is always with respect to the rest of the matter in the universe. But you would not see, you would not see at any point in time, the start of the universe or the stop of the of motion. Oh uh, yeah, okay. So, okay, so you're saying, okay, motion's eternal. So that means that the pull of the ropes is eternal. Yeah, and remember okay. the, ropes, the ropes don't pull. I wanna make sure we always clarify that. Uh, in, in mathematical physics, uh, they have pull, push, uh, they have four forces, right? They have pull, push, maybe, and perhaps. <laughs> the four forces of quantum mechanics. Because if you take the gluon, the, the, the strong force, and you take the uh, weak force, you know, weak force is a push force, and the gluon, is, or, or the strong force, is a pull force. So we still have two pulls and two pushes. Not, no one invented anything other than pull and push. But I invented a third push, a, a third uh, force, okay, which is not a force at all. It's called tension. The rope is always under tension. It doesn't pull. It doesn't push. It always, it always maintains the same tension between two atoms, and that tension is regulated by the velocity of light, which is... So there's tension on motion? No, what I'm saying is the tension is the 300,000 kilometers per second, which is the speed of light, is a measure of the tension on the rope. All you can do with a rope is change the number of links and make them smaller or, un, you know, unwind them and make the links longer. Oh, and okay, yeah, link. okay. Frequency times wavelength is the velocity of light, and it's a constant. And if you torque the rope more, you still have frequency times wavelength. The frequency has increased. The number of links, the link length has decreased. So okay. for a given length of rope, you know, you're going to have fewer links and each link uh, and each link is going to be longer and vice versa. If, uh, if you tighten the rope, you know, each link is going to become smaller and you're going to have more links. That's frequency times wavelength right there. Uh, okay. So, but is the tension motion? No, no, but this is what I'm saying. Okay, uh, uh, let me get back to tension. So tension means the following. It means no one wins the tug of war. In the case of in, uh, the word force means that someone wins the tug of, wars, uh, uh, of war. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. If you push, means that you move something in some direction. If you pull, you move something in some direction. When you're under tension, it's like if you have, I'll take my magic wand here, okay? It's like if you have a stick. You have to think of it like that, like a solid stake uh, that doesn't change. That's tension. There is no one winning the tug of war. And I'm saying that the rope is always under tension. So the rope doesn't pull. It's the atoms that might move in one direction or another. Oh, but, yeah. the, but the atoms, the atoms also, because they're made out of the rope, the atoms slide along the rope. Okay, so it, it, I'm trying to <laughs> see, it does this. The atom moves through the rope because it's made out of the rope. So it slides like a bead on an abacus also. The tension always remains the same between any two atoms on the rope. And no. that's why Einstein could not explain why you do not add the speed of light to the flashlight that you turned on on the train. 
Why don't you add the speed of the train to the speed of light? Because the atoms are going right through the rope. They're sliding through the rope. That's why you do not have to add the speed of the train uh, to the speed of light. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, I'm kind of, I'm understanding things <laughs> a little better. All it's right. a lot that, I mean, you know, this is something that it takes a whole day to explain the, every piece of it. I'm, I'm just giving you snapshots. Here. I know, because, yeah, because, like, the question is, like, suppose there was something like God or even something that, you know, existed and it operated on natural laws. I guess it would just have to be able to withstand the negative 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And it was an eternal being and it had consciousness. Like, what would the experience be like always existing? It's always hard to imagine that because it's like, you know, no one has had that experience before. But <laughs> we've done about our best to wrap our minds around, like, you know, that paradox. So thanks for giving that, Bill. And and, and thanks, Jason, for you know asking some good questions. Can I ask, All right, I guess to close it off. Uh, go ahead. One more. Sorry, I didn't. I mean, I, yeah, so no. I'm just... I'm curious, um, since you you know you brought up Einstein and he's come up in the past, um, what what are the implications of your view for things like time dilation? Um, well, I explained that very well, and and let me just give you a quick answer to that. Uh, we have uh, two twins, for example, the famous twin paradox. I guess you heard about that. One mm -hmm. twin goes out and goes around a black hole, comes back, he finds his brother is 40, 30, 40 years older than him, depending on how fast he traveled, etc. We got a problem, and this is very easily solved, okay? Very easily solved in this uh, fences with uh, time dilation altogether in that context. And, that, and this is the following. How many times uh, did the Earth go around the sun? Well, it went around the sun 20 years, uh, 20 times. So that's 20 years, because the definition of the word year is the orbit of the Earth around the sun. That's how, you know, we don't count the candles on your birthday cake with a, with a uh, atomic clock. We count them by the number of years, which means the number of times the Earth went around the sun. So if the twin went out to the black hole and came back, how many times went, uh, how many years have gone by? Well, the number of years is always determined by the Earth going around the sun. And if the Earth went around the sun 20 years, that's how many years went by. And we don't care what his atomic clock says. You know, we count the number of years according to the Earth. And so when this guy comes back, they say first that, 40 years have gone by maybe for the uh, twin that stayed at home and only two years for the guy who traveled. That's wrong. If it was 40 years, that's 40 years. And the guy who says two years is wrong, period. And now the other issue is whether the guy aged. He became older, younger, uh, younger by traveling or stayed young while the other guy, uh, you know, became older. Well, I, I like to use a real nasty trick there. And I say, what if the guy who traveled suddenly caught progeria soon as he left the earth you know he's going to die probably to come back dead because he aged very fast which has absolutely nothing to do with time but has to do with you know other factors uh, oh, biological wow. factors so we cannot say how old the guy's going to be uh, if he comes back i mean in terms of biological time and if we want to know how much time went by we just count the number of uh, earth orbits and we're done that's how we yeah, do Yeah, so like for one guy, if it if it's like if he came back and that took 20 um, circular movements of the Earth around the sun, then for the other guy, it's also going to be 20. It's not going to be like 2080. Yeah, that's a good, yeah. I, 20, I don't 20, care 20, what his atomic clock measures. Yeah, his consistent. atomic yeah. clock might say two years. I don't care. That That's his clock. He's got to yeah. get fixed. Oh, come on. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, so, right. So he's his clock says it only took him two years. Yeah. And the intuition is that his body is only going to have aged as if it was only two years. Yeah, but again, if he caught progeria, he might be older than his brother. <laughs> True. <laughs> so True, that's but... a biological issue. True, but then, and then there's the issue of the experience of it. And again, the intuition is he will have experienced it as only two years, not as 20 years, whereas his well, brother would have experienced it as 20 years. Well, for that, we have psychologists. <laughs> <laughs> That's there you go. Well, all right. All righty. Yeah. Okay. All right, Bill. I think we should close off. I want to talk just a little bit about uh flat earth videos because I know you recently you talk against uh people who believe that the earth is flat and they give like varying evidences and stuff. So why don't you give us some of the best evidences they have and like debunk it or debunk their misunderstandings? Yeah. Well, the, the the for me it's just outrageous that in this day and age we have people who believe in in the flat earth. The problem with the flat earthers is, uh, on the one hand, uh, they they criticize the establishment. They don't believe a lot of stuff of the establishment, and a lot of them are simply people who are into politics. They're into um, 
uh, you know, um, uh, conspiracies. Okay, a lot of them are are heavily into that. Nothing wrong with that, but keep it within politics. Don't bring it into science. That's one issue. But then, what's the issue? They they try to explain gravity, and you have these different explanations, which really have a very little mechanistic uh, explanations. What they have is simply saying, you know, it's more density. It's density. You know, this is how they would explain gravity. Or another guy says. Well, it's not that uh, the astronaut falls to Earth, but that the Earth comes up against the astronaut, and and so on and on and on. And I ask only one question of the uh, flat Earthers, and I say, "How flat is flat?" That's the question. How flat is flat? I mean, flat is too dim too deep. That's flat. And if it's more than two uh, D, what are you talking about? A pancake, maybe? That's got three D. That's that's not flat. So what do you mean by flat? And no one ever defined the word flat. They just talk about the flat earth, but they never say how flat it is because they never defined the word flat. And I, that's why I define mm -hmm. the word flat. I say it's uh, flat is 2D. That's what flat is. And if they don't like it, well, all they have to do is give me a better definition, you know, a better mousetrap. So obviously we're on something 3D. So it's like, yeah. And it would have to be like the pancake. I guess they mean it's less globular and like closer to that of a pancake. Like it's not you know, completely flat, but it's closer right. to that than like the big glow, you know? Yeah, but again, uh, there, there's a lot of stuff they cannot explain right. uh, in a rational way, okay? They, they explain it in their minds, but they don't explain it in a rational way. One of the issues that I do attack is uh, their argument that you cannot curve water, uh, you know, in a, um, in, in a global earth, they say, look, water always stays flat. When I put water in my bathtub, it's always flat and the rubber duck is floating on a flat, you know, surface, right? Okay, this is their argument. They say, so how can you curve water? You know, how do you, how do you get the oceans to curve assuming there's a globe, right? And uh, yeah, with a rope model, no problem because every atom of the water, every atom of the air is connected to the center of the earth. So, you know, if, if you look at that, that gives you a, a spherical, uh, object essentially, and so water is curved very easily under my uh, under the rope model. But uh, but in in their case, they say, look, it's got to be flat. And I'm saying, no, it doesn't have to be flat because you know they're looking at a small surface all the time. They're they're not looking at a, a you know like from outer space. If you look at the Earth, well, you know, then you can see it's curved. But they say, well, we never went into space, and they get into the conspiracy mode at that point. And so it's very hard to argue. Yeah. With people. Okay, all right, yeah, that's interesting. All right, I guess uh, before we tune out, I'll just let Jason come in with some final comments and I'll just give, you know, closing statements. <laughs> oh, I, I don't, I was going to just say that I don't, I, I've heard this water can't be curved line before. I just don't even understand it. I just, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I mean, yeah, I mean, there's the, the, uh, the shape that the earth casts on the moon during an eclipse is another extremely good piece. The only thing that would cast a consistently circular sh uh, shadow is a sphere. Um, I don't know how you get a pancake to always cast a circular shadow <laughs> <laughs> on the moon. Anyway, um, but yeah, I, I, Bill, thank you for coming. I really enjoyed hearing your views and exploring that with you. Um, I'm not sure that I understand everything as you say. This is a yeah. introduction. No one does the first day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <Don't believe me. laughs> yeah. uh, but I appreciate your handling all of the questions I threw at you, um, and uh, you know, doing it uh, in good humor and. <laughs> Uh, I think you answered everything thoroughly. I mean, I still have lots of questions, but obviously. Next time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I yeah, know. That's, that's just like the thing. Like, he's, <laughs> yeah, he's big into like semantics because I think there's like an issue of miscommunication because like Bill will say like, you know, jumping doesn't exist. And people will think like, oh, he's saying jumping doesn't exist. He's implying semantically that jumping doesn't happen. But he, that's not what he's saying. He's saying jumping happens. You see, we can see it. But that is not the same as saying it exists in a scientific context. Because existence, I mean, you can only, in order to use a term validly, it has to be consistently used. So if you're going to define existence as, you know, that which is three-dimensional or that which has is three-dimensional and has location, you can't also say that it's an event. So like the best way to say it is that jumping really happens, but that's a description of existence. Jumping is not existence itself. It's a description of existence. It's all about proper semantics, you know? So, and, and like, that takes a long time for people to like understand because they got to take out their like the ordinary definitions they've been used to make associations with. And that takes a long time. And then they can kind of understand what Bill's getting at, you know? Like, you know, like people will sometimes use like dimensions, coordinate and vectors, like, you know, synonymously. Like Hawkins said like, hey, the plane's a certain height above sea level, but but that, you know, height's what a, an object has, you know, it's a certain, 
elevation. 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 Or, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah the, the elevation, elevation, or altitude. elevation above the sea, not a certain height. Height's what a person has. We can be you know, measured. So it's like that. So yeah, I think it, you know it's interesting and it gives you it makes you see like the world and the the way it should be seen. You know. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, um, like I said, I don't, I can't claim to believe it because I don't understand all of it, and it is contrary to to stuff that I've learned. Uh, <laughs> so there's that issue too. <laughs> but nonetheless i did find it very interesting and uh and i, I really appreciate your coming here and telling you gotta us come it. to our conference the next time <laughs> well an excuse to go to germany sounds yeah, i know i think they're uh, thinking about doing it in austria in salzburg okay. either way oh. yeah <laughs> yeah all righty well thank you all very much for tuning in and in a couple of minutes i'll have this link and i'll send it to you to both to share around and you can share this on your national science facebook page bill I'm sure a lot of people there's a lot on here I'm, we cover a bunch of diverse topics so it's like an all-in-one bundle so i'm sure your views will your viewers will appreciate this one all righty guys thanks a lot and you all have a good day <laughs> bye-bye yeah